Okay, to kind of like flip this around a little bit, there maybe there's a chance that some small scale growers are um, experimenting with or, or using regularly a crop like wheat. But in, in case this helps to inform anybody who's growing at a larger scale, it's not a market gardener. Over sowing or frost seeding clover into wheat is like one of the best ways that you can work in a cover crop into this like relay cropping rotation. And if you're not familiar with frost seeding, it's when you go out like at late winter and you broadcast or you drill a cover crop, in this case, red clover, into wheat. And the wheat, mind you, is only like, you know, six inches tall because it's dormant for winter. And it, if you're not drilling and you're just broadcasting, it's called frost seeding because as the frost heave kind of makes the soil go up and down, it makes those seeds work their way into the soil over time. In this case, this is either a medium or short red clover. And as the wheat is maturing, so like in, in this case, you can see the picture on the left, the wheat's drying down. There's no like, you know, green left on that wheat. That's when the red clover begins to kind of like really get a foothold. And so then after that wheat is taken off, it's harvested in June, let's say, you have a, a well-established cover for the summer. It grows. If you were uh, cutting hay or if you're grazing, there's like great opportunity there for that, at least one cutting. And then compared to going into fall, it could maybe compared to a bare fallow or whatever else where you're like fall planting a cover crop to go into the next winter, your red clover is months ahead of that fall planted red clover, which gives you just like way extra season, um, way more biomass, way more good stuff just getting pumped underground during that time. And I would actually add that that's a great example of a point I try to make to people a lot, especially home gardeners just tell me they don't have time to cover crop. And I use the example of tomatoes. You can come out, and once the tomatoes are a couple feet off the ground, you can come out and sow a cover crop. If you wait till August, you can sow a fall cover crop, but you could sow a summer cover crop and then just mow it down, sowing a fall cover crop into it. The truth is that as long as those tomatoes are in their big, still putting foliage kind of um, growth spurt on, that cover crop is going to look really anemic to you, and you're going to wonder why you wasted your seed. But tomatoes in particular, though it happens with all kinds of other plants too, they actually have a stage late in their season, which has a name for it, which I forget, where they start to lose a fair amount of leaves. And when that happens, that cover crop that was just kind of sitting there holding, wishing it had light, is completely released. And you can do that with a lot of crops. You put it in there on faith. And what the crop is going to do, it's not going to give up. Life is going to try to thrive it's going to go, not a lot of sun, go deeper. It's going to be developing its root system, waiting for that moment. Because as we see in forest and everywhere else, that happens all the time in nature. Plants get started and then they wait for release. And the same, we can, we can follow that same rhythm with this kind of cover cropping system. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Um, another throw out to anyone who might be working at larger scales and grain systems, et cetera, although this is still totally appropriate for um, folks at the like market garden scale, if you happen to work with corn, uh, is interceding into corn. And this could be interceding with a, a piece of equipment like this, or it could just be broadcast into it. And there's been some good research to identify that the earlier you plant your cover crop into that corn, the less corn you get out of it, the lower your yields are. And the later you plant that cover crop, you get more corn yield, but you get less cover crop at the end of the year. And so there's this sweet spot that seems to be around V4 or V5, which is when the, the corn plant has four to five leaves, um, where you can kind of balance those two goals. So that when the time you take your corn off, whether that's for grain or for sweet corn or whatever it is, uh, your cover crop is way better established going into winter compared to like a fall planted cover crop. Um, so you're kind of taking advantage of this like complementary growth habit and timing. And so for just a couple of pictures of what that looks like, the picture on the right is cover crops interceded in the corn that's like at dry down just before harvest. And then the picture on the left is a similar cover crop, but a different mix the following spring. And a little advice I give on that is if you are broadcasting, which a lot of people, that's the only way you can do it. You don't have this fancy equipment to intercede. Um, you want to look at the weather. And you want, you want to do it in a week where there's a, a really good chance of rain spread through the week. You know, because it's, and indeed, the one time we tried to do this, I think it was 2016 or 17, when we had severe drought here in Western North Carolina, our attempts at this were an absolute failure. You know, if you 
If you can, if we, where we could drill cover crops, we could get germination from a little bit of residual moisture. But if you're counting on broadcasting under things like this, if you don't have the ability to irrigate, then you need to count on doing it at a, on a week when there's some rain predicted to happen, maybe a couple times in the week. It doesn't need to be a lot of rain, just enough to help that radical to get out of its seed, out of its, um, seed and into the soil. And once it's in the soil, it'll take care of itself. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and it's worth noting that if you are broadcasting seed, that the larger the seed, the harder it is to get it to work. So yep. like a, a little bitty clover seed takes really easily. Buckwheat, maybe somewhere in the middle. Peas, for example, <laughs> they're like yeah. really hard to get to work. And we'll, we'll actually have a, a slide and a couple of slides on um, a broadcasting method that takes advantage of residue. But we'll, we'll get to that momentarily. So... Cover cropping is a huge piece of capturing solar energy. And we're making the point that cover cropping can happen all the time, even when you're growing your crops. But it also can be part of your plan, your weed management plan. And this is, as Mark noticed, an archival picture that I actually bought a little machine to turn from a photograph into a slide, a, a digital slide. This is about 20 years old. It was after hearing Elaine Ingham for the first time explain to me that and us at, a, at the um, 1997 Ecofarm conference, that plants are putting 50 to 80 percent of what they photosynthesize under the soil, and 30 to 50 percent of that is being pumped out into the soil as a plant exudate. And that year, I just basically was on fire with taking advantage of that, and that's actually the inspiration for this talk. And so I did a lot of experience that year. I had an impact such that. My two major um, bosses came to the garden at different times and said, you've done something different. There's something different about this garden. It is different and it's better. And it was that maximizing solar collection. And one of the experiments I did, we always have a problem with keeping our squash patch, patch weeded. And this is at a, at a resort hotel where things have to look good, right? The main point of the garden was a display garden. So what I did was first establish a buckwheat cover crop. And, Mark said, was it about two weeks out? And then, frankly, it was 20 years ago. I don't remember. <laughs> you know, but but it, it, wasn't, it couldn't have been a lot more or the squash wouldn't have been able to compete. So I first established buckwheat. I then took a flamer and flamed these strips. You can see a few of them in the picture. And then we came, and we actually, you're missing something because I was on fire, remember, about plants pumping in. We put little squash seedlings out. There was actually lettuce around in those patches where you see bare mulch now. There was lettuce. So we first grew lettuce even around the squash. But meanwhile, the, the buckwheat was growing up. Then we harvested the lettuce, and because we didn't want weeds, weeds couldn't happen, we did mulch a little bit in those areas that we, that we still had flamed bare soil in. Um, we didn't think that the, it was worth trying to grow anything else because we knew that shortly the squash was going to take over. Then Robin Kahanowicz, who is a longtime active member of CFSA, was working there and was part-time working in the garden, and she came down every week, twice a week, with hedge, hedge trimmers and just cut enough of the cover crop back to allow the squash to grow into the cover crop. And basically, once the squash grew in, it rapidly canopied over the area and we didn't get weeds. And that year, that patch was the most weed-free squash patch we'd ever had. It also yielded incredibly. And we had probably, I don't know, in an area that was like 100 feet long by maybe 60 feet wide. We had maybe 10 or 15 lambs quarters and amaranths and weeds like that that managed to find their way up. Otherwise, we had complete control. Um, and wherever the, we didn't need to cut it back, we had flowering buckwheat that was feeding the beneficial insects. By the way, I don't think you need to do the hedge trimmers. I think there's plenty of other tools that could have done that. Yeah, would a weed yeah. eater work? Weed eater would work um, if you had a like an, an Alice Chalmers G type tractor and you could drive over the, early on anyways. They would eventually get too long for that. But in the beginning, you could just have a little side mower or something that mowed it. Lots of different ways to, could, buckwheat's very easy to kill. These are the peas that we, that we had growing, in the, that you saw in the earlier slide, growing amongst the um, cauliflower. This is Holon Dao. It took me a long time to find these. Um, I finally, years ago, I got a directive from my same employer at the Highland Lake Inn. He'd eaten pea shoots somewhere. He said, grow them. And so I tried lots of peas to get, get the pea shoot that was best. And finally, I learned from Stokes, Stokes um, Seed Company that they had 
um, a large demand for Holandao in Canada for Chinese restaurants to grow their own pea seeds. By the way, if you're buying them from Stokes, be sure to order, order the untreated ones. As an organic grower, you don't ever want treated seed, and you sure don't want to eat pea shoots off of a pea seed, off of a treated pea seed. But I learned from uh, Mother Earth News when I wrote an article about this um, on winter gardening that they looked it up and that Holandao is spelled differently, but phonetically, Holandao means pea shoot. This is the Chinese variety pea for pea shoot. It makes a much more succulent, bigger, and robust pea shoot. And what I learned at Highland Lake Inn, where we could use a lot of these, is that I could plant these amongst all kinds of crops any time of year except for deep, hard freeze when they would be damaged, and they would grow. They would produce pea shoots in the summer or in warm weather within 10 days, and I could get one to three cuttings from them. They, they, all pea shoots reach a point where they're not worth it, where the growth gets uneven, and you can't easily grab a bunch of them and cut them at that sweet spot where they're tender. Um, and they also start to get like, dying material from the multiple cuts where you have too much dead stuff in there. So at a certain point, you're gonna stop harvesting the pea shoots. What happens in the summertime um, is they don't die, but they kind of just malinger there. They're, they're planted densely enough because you want pea shoots um, that they suppress the weeds and they just kind of sit there as a kind of green, kind of brown living mass. But what can happen is you can have a week, like we often have in the mountains anyways, where a hurricane blows in or 10 days and they have all this still latent energy and they may suddenly shoot their vines out and make you a small crop of peas. So it really can be quite beneficial to grow these and I highly recommend any number of pea shoots work, but Holandao I find to be the one that I get the biggest volume and the highest quality from. Okay, for a, a quick kind of a, a side jaunt into a little bit about cover crop establishment because I, I mentioned this a few slides back where broadcasting cover crop seed can be a little bit dicey, totally depends on the weather. And the surest way, the, or maybe the easiest way to get you close to being like sure success is to do what we call the sow and mow method. And it doesn't have to be mowing, but that's just maybe where this whole thing started. But you broadcast your cover crop seed into a standing crop. That could be a cover crop, it could be a cash crop. And then you flail mow the whole thing down or you weed eat or whatever your mower is of choice. It creates this, nice mulch it just kind of lays on top and and even though it's a little it doesn't have to be a lot of mulch it could just be a little bit and just a little bit of mulch can go a really really long way um significantly improves germination like by, by a lot um i i can't say enough good about this method if you have like standing crop residue in there that you can throw your seeds into and just chop down it's super helpful method yeah i i can testify that this particular um, you can see the cover crop I was sowing into in the back of that slide. It was a really high multi-species cover crop. Um, and we couldn't fit the slide, the next slide I'd love for you to see here time-wise, but it gives me a moment to promote a, a talk that I have coming up that's going to be online at livingwimpfarms.org. And when you go back and look at it, you'll see the result of this, um, which is that within less than, I'd say, eight days, we had cover crop coming up that was six inches tall because we had good rains and all that biomass held the rain in and the cover crop just jumped incredibly. The one time this system doesn't work is the same situation I talked about. It was 2016 or 17, severe drought. We couldn't get the cover crop to germinate for anything. And we actually had sprinklers, but with that much drought, even with the mulch covering, it wouldn't work. So it's not a guaranteed situation. Drought's the wild card, mm -hmm. you know? Drought's a wild card about a lot of things though. Yep. Uh, final note about this slide is that the, the picture on the right is a zoom in of a similar situation. It's not this um, same situation where Pat's broadcasting, but that is a crimped cover crop. It was a crimped summer cover crop with, in this case, that's a winter lentil that was planted into that. And it came up really nicely in that uh, crimped crop. And by the way, one last point I'd make, I don't recommend sowing from a bucket. I'm pretty good at it. I've been doing it for a long time. But if you get yourself one brand is Earthway, one of those, you know, strap over your shoulder, um, uh, cedars, it is a lot more cost effective as far as seed goes. You can get far more even distribution and not use as much seed. I just, it was at the other farm. <laughs> I didn't want to take the time to go get it. Um, we have a couple farms. Yeah, and so just to maybe provide an example of a similar situation, it's not exactly a sow and mow, but can be done really 
easily and I think works really well is in cutting a sweet potato vines, getting them out of the way as you harvest, dig up your sweet potatoes, spread cover crop seed, and then just put the vines back. And so that's the, the uh, sequence of pictures that you see there is like cutting vines, of course digging potatoes, then we um, spread seed, and then the picture on the right is all the uh, leaf mass just kind of put back on top of that. It's super easy to do, it's lightweight, it's not any heavy lifting, and it was relatively quick. And this is a picture about 10 days later of, and I think it was a oats, clover, and buckwheat mix planted in a, a little bit late for buckwheat, but middle October, and within eight days, it looked about like this. So um, really good establishment with just simple as pulling the vines out of the way and putting them back. I love this because every year, I look at all those sweet potato vines and just hate that we're not using them somehow. If anybody doesn't know it, they're, by the way, edible. So make sure and harvest a bunch of them to eat. They're really good eating. Um, but you can't possibly eat all the sweet potato vines you're gonna have for any sweet potato crop. And so, and they're also, ironically, sweet potatoes are nutritional powerhouses, but the one thing they don't have a lot of is protein. The leaves do. And so protein is also nitrogen. And we still are, we're still using more, we're still capturing more solar energy for our crop by pulling them back on top of that seed because that solar energy is embodied in that buckwheat residue and it's going to decay where the cover crop is and gonna become rapidly available and taken up by the cover crop rather than being lost. So it's a win-win thing and I love that. We're gonna be doing it next year, I promise you. <laughs>